I am really excited to be here to talk to all of you. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on Moonlight. I've been at MSU for about a year, but this program fell into our lap where I was invited to join into um, the Small But Mighty team back in February. And since then, I'm like, how do more people not know about the lack of connectivity that is in the state of Michigan? I live um, in East Lansing, but like near Bath. And I'm only able to, I only have access to WOW internet does anyone else have WOW internet in here? Okay, so if there's any WOW representatives, I'm sorry for my next statement, but it is horrible. I choose to come to work every day because there is better internet on campus than there is at my home. So the impact with the lack of connectivity around the state of Michigan is something that we need to address. And I know I'm speaking to a room of people who are familiar because in March of 2020, we all transitioned to learning and working online. And so the luxury of having high-speed internet or having high-speed broadband internet became a necessity. It became a priority in terms of addressing connectivity from the local to state to federal level. Um, I thought these facts I want to share with you all were actually pretty shocking because more than there's, let's actually go back to my talking points, but there are hundreds of thousands of Michiganders who still do not have access to broadband internet. And the state of Michigan currently ranks 33rd in the nation with connectivity. So those familiar with the state of Michigan are probably able to rationalize these facts, but take a second to think about how much of our everyday lives are dependent on broadband internet. We are able to, for our commerce and our educational needs, you need virtual, you need internet for your meetings, your online classes, and my favorite is to binge watch Netflix. I just shouldn't finish Stranger Things, and I could not do that if I was in the UP as fast. So connectivity creates opportunity and promotes better economic development and growth. So it is not okay for so many Michigan residents at that to still not have access to broadband. Connectivity is also really important for MSU's outreach activities as it will facilitate more effective knowledge transfers and encourage the innovation of cutting edge technologies and applications. Next slide, please. So in June of this year, we celebrated the awarding of the $10.5 million grant from the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, better known as NTIA, to joint recipients MSU and Merit Network. We were joined by members of the MSU community, as well as, there's a few familiar faces, um, but we were joined by the MSU President Stanley and Andy Burke from the U.S. Department of Commerce and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, and on behalf of all who are involved with Moonlight, it meant a lot to us because we were able to have such notable representation work the significance of Moonlight. They endorsed the power of this partnership between Merritt and Michigan State. And most importantly, the acknowledgement of this major step towards eliminating discrepancies in broadband access across the entire state. So Moonlight leverages middle mile infrastructure to allow internet service providers to make available affordable high-speed broadband internet to unserved and underserved Michigan communities. This initiative by far has extreme potential, but Later in our presentation, Joe will speak to that because he can explain it 10 times better than I ever can. So the better broadband Moonlight offers will extend new opportunities to rural residents, people who are surrounding in the MSU community like myself, and it will include the making, the sharing of life enhancing information from organizations such as MSU Extension. And then there's a lot of departments and units as well on campus who are doing great work in this space. Moonlight also strengthens MSU's mission, commitment, and responsibility to providing an outstanding undergraduate, graduate, and professional education to students. As you guys probably know, but just here to reinforce it, Spartans want to be in places where our will allows us to solve pressing problems in partnership with those we serve, like the partnership between Merit and MSU's Fellow Center, which provides an ideal transition to our virtual attendee, um, Dr. Johannes Bauer, who sent in a pre-recorded video because he is quite literally in two places at once today. This video is playing. Would you want to introduce? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with this. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I can't. He's not here to ask him, so I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Bauer, Dr. Johannes Bauer, was appointed as a Quello Chair for Media and Information Policy and Director of the Quello Center at MSU in August 2018. Quello Center, as we'll hear more about, conducts research and outreach to inform public debate on media, communication, and information policy. Dr. Bauer previously served as the chairperson of the Department of Media and Information and currently serves on the Center for Community and Economic Development Faculty Board of Advisors, which you will know well here at MSU. He was 
trained as an engineer and economist, and holds an MA and PhDs in economics from the Vienna Institute, University of Economics and Business Administration in Austria. While at MSU, he also had appointments as a visiting professor at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, the University of Konstanz, Germany, and the University of Zurich, Switzerland. Much of his research centers on policy issues critical to the Quello Center, such as the design of policy and regulation for advanced media and the internet, cybersecurity, innovation in the digital economy, and measures to increase digital inclusion. And I'll say one last thing. He, he couldn't be here because there's so much going on related to this, the, the need to figure out how to bring broadband to everyone, that there's another conference in Detroit. And so to splitting up the team here to represent at both conferences, but thanks to the digital technology that we're talking about here, we'll get to hear from uh, Dr. All right, thank you, Mitch. And just to add a little more context to that, we had committed, Johannes and I, and Laura, had committed to co-present here today at this really important conference. And after we scheduled this and we're on the agenda, the federal government and the state of Michigan, the governor's office, asked Johannes to present in Detroit. So uh, Michigan is getting ready to spend $1.5 billion on broadband uh, through the federal IIJA uh, program. So uh, we all, you know, said, Johannes, you've got to go to that. And he <laughs> sends his regrets, but he took time this weekend to send a nice uh, pre-recorded message to you. And I know that's not typical in these kind of things, but I hope you understand the circumstances. Well, in, in this day and age, we get used to seeing each other via Zoom, so we should just assume. <laughs> All right, so here's your line. Thank you, Lauren. I would like to say a few things about the repercussions of discrepancies in internet access. The data I'm showing you here were collected right before the pandemic. They reflect how discrepancies in broadband access affect educational outcomes. At the time, we had a big discussion across the country on how lack of broadband access caused a homework gap, meaning that students without access to broadband could not complete their homework and then had perhaps lower grades. We thought that this was a very simplistic view of things and went into the field collecting almost 4,000 data points. All of he identified so that we could not link any individual observations to a person. And here's what we found. At the time, 47% of students in rural areas and K through 12 students, I should say, especially uh, eighth through 12th grade, were without high speed internet access. This contrasts to 23% of students in suburbs who were without high speed internet access. These discrepancies in uh, internet access did actually translate into grades and into the ability to complete homework. So for example, we saw that students with fast internet access on average had almost a half uh, grade point average higher grade than students without um, internet access or who had to rely on a cell phone only not without a, a tablet or a laptop that was connected to a wireless net, which was just a phone. We also saw that students that had no access at home or only cell phone access scored lower on standardized test scores, for example, the SAT and PSAT tests, uh, lower scores in reading, writing, math, and in the total score. It doesn't end here. We also saw that students who had no access to the internet or only slow access had a low intention to pursue post-secondary uh, education in college. They also have lower intentions to pursue STEM-related careers. Now, these remember these are careers that are future-proof. These are careers that typically uh, entail higher lifelong income. So, the bottom line of the study, which you can uh, find online at the Cross and is that broadband discrepancies have repercussions that go way beyond just the immediate uh, effects of not having internet access. They have lifelong education educational consequences, they have lifelong consequences on, on the prosperity of households of the community. So this gives us lots of opportunities to create a more prosperous, forward-looking Michigan. But the challenges are not small. Right? Currently, we fortunately have a discussion that focuses on network access and digital skills. 
Uh, we need both. We need access and we need the skills to handle these technologies. But as the graph here shows, if we want to completely harness the benefits of broadband going forward, we also need to think further. We need to think how to develop uh, technologies that truly are human-centric in the design that do not include people that are differentiated, able to hold people uh, from their use. So, for example, banks, financial institutions, healthcare providers need to design technologies that really have citizens and humans in mind. And finally, we need to train uh, the ability to adapt to the next generation of technology. As we talk, new technologies, virtual reality, extended reality, artificial intelligence come uh, to us and they will require new skills and new devices and potentially even higher quality access. So communities need to face these four levels of, of, of digital uh, inequalities and discrepancies. And planning today focuses naturally on access and digital skills, but we have to think about those other aspects too. And with this, I'll turn it over to Joe to continue uh, talking about the details of Project Moonlight. Right. Thank you, Johannes. Yes, thank you for taking the time. Next up is uh, Joe Sawaski. He's the president and CEO of Merit Network, and he just suggested I just leave it at that for now. In the interest of time, because of my uh, inability to play that video properly, Johannes had a beautiful video of himself speaking as well, so don't tell him you didn't see that. Okay? <laughs> so, but he's been a, just a fantastic partner. Mitch, thank you for that introduction, and Lauren, thank you for your really insightful remarks at the beginning. So um, I'm here to talk about the title of this presentation specifically, which is the Moonlight Project, which is a, we're calling it an open access middle mile program, one of the first in the United States, and we're really hoping this vaults Michigan to the forefront of connectivity. So why are we here? Well, even though Dr. Lamort did not complete his homework for the provost, as we heard about in the opening uh, plenary, we have done our homework here in Michigan on at least the topic of broadband. So we're here because internet sucks in Michigan. We rank 33rd, as Lauren indicated. We're in the bottom half, almost the bottom third of states, even though we're a top 10 state in so many other regards across the country. What you see on this graph, uh, the dark red, is where the telecom industry has told the federal government uh, they do not provide modern broadband service. So you can see there's some dark red here. The light red dots all over the place re represent census blocks where on the ground everyday internet testing from citizens shows that they are unserved with modern internet access. So the problem, the federal government has not recognized the extent of this problem in Michigan. And to make things even worse, these, this data was produced uh, with the old internet standard that existed at the beginning of this year, 2022, which is 25 megabits down, three megabits up. The federal government just this year increased that standard by a factor of four. So now what the federal government is calling broadband service is essentially 100 megabits down and 20 up or 100 up, depending on uh, which program you look at. So this is an understatement of the unserved areas in Michigan, people who do not have internet access. It's, a, it's terrible, right? This is the 21st century in, in America of all places. Now, remember these little blue dots all over because this is what I'm going to talk about in a moment, and this represents where our Moonlight Project is focused. And I'm going to talk about how this is going to help these other regions that are red, and even more that we don't see uh, that are, which should be in red on this screen. So before I talk about the destination, though, a little context in the history about the journey to how we got to Moonlight. So in 2018, I was privileged to participate and represent the universities across the state uh, former Governor Rick Snyder's Broadband Task Force. They were attempting to develop Michigan's first uh, long-term bro uh, broadband roadmap. And you know, I came in representing Merit Network, which is essentially a business-to-business -business network. We're the ISP for Michigan State University and the University of Michigan. They're really finicky about their internet service. We think we're the best in the state. I hope they agree. Even if PowerPoint's not working, the internet is working, <laughs> as, you, uh, as you may see here today. So. When I went in and participated in road shows across Michigan, I heard the plight of rural citizens having to take their children to McDonald's at night to complete their digital homework, having to sit in library parking lots on snowy nights to look for job information. And it was at that moment where I said, Merritt is gonna get busy and try to help this state. Um, we can do better than that. 
And you know, during COVID, it was a shame because Merit was providing incredible capacity to a lot of anchor institutions, K through 12, libraries, universities, yet everyone was at home. They were in these areas where they couldn't actually access that infrastructure. So we are on a mission and a tight partnership with Michigan State to actually help Michigan do better. So I discovered the Quello Center actually before 2018, uh, Mitch Shapiro and some uh, former uh, faculty members at the Quello Center helped us write a report on wireless technologies and how we could use them more in research and education and nonprofit networks. But they were fantastic partners in doing this, uh, this study that uh, Johannes uh, really nicely described earlier, the student performance gap study. And he's a very humble person, but I can tell you, this was nationally groundbreaking work that had never been done the United States had never quantified the academic impact of the homework gap on students, so kudos to Michigan State. Some, it, his report was actually cited in President Biden's annual economic report earlier this year. That's how important it was for the country, and it's cited very briefly. Um, we're doing broadband survey work now for others, uh, counties uh, and, and groups of counties across the state, and we're finding great partnerships with those folks. And then finally, the, the project I'm talking about here at the end of this uh, presentation is Moonlight. Remember those little blue dots? I'm going to explain those as we go in here. So a little bit about Merit. We're the longest running research and education network in the United States. We were formed in 1966 when wild-eyed faculty members uh, wanted to share information between their standalone computers. It's never been done before. So they formed Merit to try to help out in that regard. And currently we are uh, uh, governed by all of the universities in Michigan, short of one. Uh, Melissa Wu, who couldn't be with us today, is my boss. She's the chair of uh, the board uh, for Merit, and we have a wonderful partnership. And we also serve almost 400 other nonprofit organizations, including almost all of K through 12 in Michigan. We provide the, the big backhaul network for all of the K through 12 ISDs in the state. And I'm moving fast here because I know we're a little tight on time. Our mission involves networking, security, and community building, especially in the technology space. I like to show this slide to give a you know show a little bit of credibility for Merit. So uh, in 1987, Merit competitively won a project to manage a network they called the National Science Foundation Network. We managed that for the entire United States through the early 90s. You now know that little thing is the global internet. So right here in Michigan, we were managing the precursor to the modern internet uh, for Ann Arbor, Michigan. So um, I, hopefully I've established credibility. It was way before my time, I may have. <laughs> Not that far, but it's uh, my great hair, I'm sure shows. Uh, and then in 2014, another important part of our history, we won two broadband technology opportunity program grants from the federal government, $130 million, to actually double the size of our network across Michigan and build infrastructure that we owned, that we didn't lease from telecommunication organizations. And what you see here is sort of the pride of the national R&D community. Merit has a sprawling, a uh, high capacity network, we call it a middle mile network, and this represents all of our main lines. What you don't see are a lot of little stars that we go out to serve other local communities, but this is the core of our network. Super high capacity, supporting incredible research projects at Michigan State, physics and social sciences and in other areas, so we're really proud of this network. I can't do any merit presentation without showing that by engineers and killing So. <laughs> What we did after I participated on Governor Snyder's uh, broadband task force, I came back to America and said, how can we get involved in helping connect residents uh, to the internet? We will never be a residential service provider, that's not our mission, but how can we get involved? So we started this program, you may, you may have seen a billboard on uh, I-75, the Michigan Moonshot, this, that's us, that's what that was all about. Uh, we got a lot of uh, play out of that. And the Michigan Moonshot essentially started with data mapping and analysis and then we started helping local communities at being educated on broadband, understanding the benefits, understanding the options they had to serve their citizens. Uh, and finally today, it's evolved into infrastructure with this Moonlight project that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. And you know, they say that uh, you can't manage what you can't measure, and nobody really understood the extent of the problem in Michigan. So that's why we got involved in a mapping process. We actually worked with the Quello Center to develop a really unique citizen science survey we do an MLAP uh, internet speed test, uh, and we're collecting all this data, and we're able to map for counties in which uh, we work where citizens have broadband and where they don't. And we're doing that better than the federal government. And the state of Michigan was not doing that themselves. The state of Michigan was relying on the federal uh, information, which was wholly inaccurate and in understating the problem. 
This gives an example of some of the counties we're working with right now. We're serving a dozen counties, we've got a few more in the pipeline. We're working with their planning commissions. Uh, we've got some folks in the audience here who represent those organizations. And we're showing them the extent of the problem and then we're helping them sort of you know, move into the next phase and they, they go on their own, right? And work with other experts to get those projects done. I've got a little blurb here about research. Merit also does deep internet research, a lot in the cybersecurity area. We actually research um, these things for the Department of Homeland Security. We work with other university faculty members. But we're now pivoting in the context of this conversation. Uh, we hired our first um, uh, technology impact researcher. So we're still collaborating with universities, but this is really in this whole broadband space. So I've got to give Purette uh, Dag a little shout out. She's a real powerhouse for those of you who know her, and she may be helping you in the future, who knows? So again, our moonshot originally started with data, funding and policy, and helping educate local communities. And now, with all of this broadband money available, pivoted in infrastructure. And this first artifact of infrastructure of our Moonlight uh, Moonshot program is called Moonlight. It stands for Michigan Open or Merit Open Access Network. And light has a whole bunch of words that we had to contort uh, to make into the word light that I don't remember. But <laughs> I'm just calling it Moonlight uh, for now. <clears throat> Let me check the time real quick here. Okay, doing well. I feel like I'm trying to speed through this to do some time for Q and A. Um, so Moonlight, what this is, as Lauren mentioned, it's a $10.5 million award from the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. It, it was uh, uh, received by Michigan State and Merritt in one of the very early infrastructure programs that was opened up last summer. And I, I'm just gonna stump a little bit here. So in, in, the, in the state of Michigan, there's a law, it's called PA 224 of 2020, that prohibits educational organizations or nonprofits that like Merritt from receiving any state broadband grants. Mm -hmm. you know, the lobbyists actually had a, you know, their way uh, with some legislators. Um, and I tell you all that because this was Merritt's for, in Michigan State's perhaps first and only hope to receive broadband funding to do this project. I'm delighted to tell you we were successful. There were 10 times the amount of applications submitted in the United States. Merritt was selected as one of 14 projects in the United States. So we did really well, I think, for the state of Michigan. And we're hoping this project serves as a foundation now for the rest of the $1.5 billion that the state of Michigan is going to get that Merritt MSU probably can't partake in. <laughs> so, anyway, we're setting the foundation. We did that very independently together uh, as well. So Moonlight's intent is to improve broadband access for underserved communities and simultaneously allow us to support the research universities in Michigan too. So it really fits within our mission very nicely. Again, we'll never be a residential service provider, but what we're doing is we're working with other communities, nonprofit, we're working with commercial ISPs in rural areas who have always needed to connect to the big networks in Chicago, Detroit, and points beyond as they're trying to serve out homes and connect homes from their, their small networks in rural areas. This project represents what I'm calling the digital autobahn in Michigan. It's sort of the freeway system, if you will, of uh, the internet. And the little local ISP projects are kind of the surface streets, if you want to think about that analogy. So we're the freeway that's getting them to Chicago and Detroit, essentially, with a lot of redundancy and capacity, and they're creating the surface street connections directly to homes in their local communities. And it's really a public-private partnership model. So we already have letters of intent from both nonprofit and commercial organizations, which is really unique. We're helping to accelerate local projects with our project, and we're also uh, uh, lowering their costs, we hope, by introducing new capabilities and additional competition in rural areas, too. So we're really <clears throat> excited about this project. And again, you know, our, our goal is not to serve residences, but to serve anchor institutions and then other networks. So that's our role here. And what Moonlight is specifically, if you remember those little turquoise dots on the Michigan map, We've got 103 co-location facilities through little brick huts you'll see on the side of roads. Those are merits, we own those. We're allowing other internet service providers to just build to those huts, one connection to those huts, and we're gonna take them all the way to Chicago where the global internet has a presence, or Detroit. And normally, ISP projects uh, who are trying to serve citizens in local areas have two, two big challenges. One is building to all those homes, 
you know, that's a lot of detailed work. You're dealing with homeowners and business owners, having to be very careful about where you bury fiber. You don't want to hit sewer lines, which does happen, you know, uh, from time to time. So they have a lot of complex work going on there. They also have to figure out how they're going to connect to the global internet. And that's where we come in with this long haul project. So we're super excited about it. <clears throat> and we'll tell you, it's going to be one of the first of its kind in the nation. There's one other state, r &E Network, who's working on this, and that's the state of California right now. California has this project they're calling the Golden Net, uh, uh, Golden State Network, I should say. They're investing $7 billion in that program. Here in Michigan, we've already built most of our fiber for that project through the gr uh, gracious and generosity of the federal government through the VTOP investments we've had. So we can kind of skip all the fiber building and we're focused now on just those co-location facilities. So my goal is to have Michigan beat California, and I hope you're with me uh, in that in that battle. Ten point five million dollars, seven billion dollars, right? Not, I'm sure there's no boondoggle that's going to happen there. Uh, in Michigan, we're not going to let that happen because we, like Spartans, right? We are doers. Uh, we're practitioners in the state. We're not just uh, theoretical here. So. We're, we're super uh, super excited about the partnerships we're establishing all around the state. Uh, I have a team in Detroit right now who's working with talking to other ISPs and local communities, talking to the state uh, about their future plans as well. So we've got a, you know, we're a small but mighty team. We've got 90, 95 employees at Merritt, and uh, we are spread out all over uh, trying to do good uh, for the state of Michigan with our excellent partners at MSU. So the importance for Michigan of this project. This will improve the economics for local uh, broadband providers and local communities who want to serve their citizens. We want to accelerate those projects and make them less expensive. It'll provide better high quality connections for anchor institutions. Even we have some of facilities still to serve K-12 schools and libraries and we're hoping this project helps there. Um, it'll support future-proofed applications that Johannes described in that top level of his, of his really cool chart. I looked at that as kind of a Maslow's hierarchy of digital needs. I'd never seen that before. I think he probably conceived of that. So again, go Michigan State. So we want this network to be able to support future applications as well, just like we support that kind of capability for universities right now. Um, there is data that shows access to high-speed connectivities associated with higher job growth, higher income, uh, more business startup activity, and usually three to four percent increase in property values the moment high-speed internet connects to a home. I experienced that myself at my home in Charlottewood. I'm way out in the woods, and as soon as that broadband came in, I noticed my Zillow estimate went up. That was pretty cool. Um, and as Johannes really uh, went into nice detail on, this is associated with better educational outcomes too. Because when you think about you know, what it takes for economic development, I mean, people is where it starts. And you've got to have an educated and trained workforce who has access to information. And we believe broadband is sort of the foundation you know, for a lot of this uh, economic development uh, in Michigan and beyond. And I'll just close by saying, before we do some uh, Q&A, if we have time, um, I heard a really wise person say recently that, look, broadband can't solve all the grand challenges of Michigan or the world, but you can't solve any one of them without it. And I thought that was a pretty uh, sage statement. So we're big believers in broadband. We're trying to do our, our part to set a digital foundation for citizens of the state. And we want Michigan to win and be not the number one connected state in the nation in this very unique project we're hoping uh, helps us do that. So thank you, thank you for your time. And that concludes, I think, our presentation.